This is an overview of Unit 11, Math 216 module. We'll be looking at the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC. First point to make is it's the rate of return that needs to be earned in order to satisfy um, investors. It's also used to provide the basis for working out what's the required return on possible investment decisions. The average overall cost of capital is made up of various components within a, an organization's financial structure. So we need, to, we need to calculate the weighted average of the different components. So these might be equity, debt. Now the formula for calculating WAC looks a bit complex. Effectively, all we're doing is we're taking the proportion of total funds from each source. So for example, what percentage of total funds is equity? What percentage is a particular type of debt? And then we look at the cost of each type of fund. What's the cost of equity, cost of debt? And we are then able to calculate the average, the weighted average cost of capital. It might be easier to look at an example in the text on page 11.8. So on this example on page 11.8, we are given the, the value of equity. Now bear in mind that we need to use the market value of equity. Bank loan is provided. We don't need to ca calculate the market value of the bank loan, it, it's, it's a given amount. The dividend rate per annum, we can use the dividend rate as the for our cost of equity in this example, and there's an interest rate in the loan. So what do we do? We itemize all the sources of uh, funding, of, it, of capital, put the dollar amounts, basically the market value over here, and then we calculate the weighting. We then put down the pre-tax cost of each, then we need to take into account the, the, the tax benefit of, of paying that interest. So the after-tax cost is, is listed over here. Bear in mind that there's no tax deduction for amounts paid to shareholders. So that, that the pre- and after-tax cost of equity stays the same. And then we apply the weighting to the after-tax cost in order to then calculate our weighted average cost of capital. We now look at the cost of debt. When we refer to debt, in calculating WAC, we normally include just long-term funds in the cost of capital. Also remember that we normally use the after-tax cost of debt. Sometimes we need to calculate the market value of debt when an organization raises debt finance by issuing publicly traded bonds. And to calculate the current value of the debt, they need to look at the coupon interest payments and they also need to look at the, the present value of the maturity amount to be paid. So the first part of this formula, which I've, I've circled, it looks effectively at the present value of future coupon interest payments. And the second part of the formula is calculating the present value of the, the par value, the, the par maturity value, which will be paid. Uh, whenever the, the debt expires. Now to calculate the cost of equity, there's two approaches. We can use dividends to work out the cost of equity, or we can use the capital asset pricing model. So firstly with dividends, we look at a single period dividend valuation model. This in practice is unusual, but what we're saying is in a year's time, we will receive a dividend. We will then sell the share at the expected market price, which are these two figures over here and then we will discount them at that particular rate to get the present value. The next unusual circumstance is where we, we have the general dividend valuation model, which is where we expect the annual dividend to remain constant in the future. This is very unusual, and if, if we did expect that, we would just divide the dividend uh, by the discount rate. And there's an example there at the bottom of 11.4 where the annual dividend is divided by the market value of the share to give us the cost of equity of 10%. As most investors would expect the dividend to grow gradually over time, we have the dividend growth valuation model, which takes into account future dividend growth. And there's an example as to how it's calculated. We also might be told the rate of growth, expected annual percentage growth in dividends. If we are not given this figure here, the, the, the growth rate, we might need to calculate it. And there's an example as to how the dividend growth, model is, growth rate is calculated. We then move on to the capital asset pricing model. Remember that the dividend growth evaluation model, as well as 
the capital asset pricing model are there to enable us to calculate the cost of equity, which we need for the weighted average cost of capital calculation. So in this case, to calculate the cost of equity, we take the risk-free rate, and then we add to that the equity market risk premium. So that's the difference between the return on market and the risk-free rate. And we multiply that equity market risk premium by what's called beta, which is the systematic risk of the equity. And there's some explanations as to the risk fee rate, beta, and the market risk premium in the text. On page 11.9, there's an example. I'll just focus on the cost of debt aspect of this example. Face value of the debt is 40 million. That means in five years' time, we will pay back the holders of the debt 40 million. In addition, we'll be paying what's called a half yearly coupon rate of 10% per annum. So every six months, there will be a payment of 5% of the 40 million, which is 2 million. And the expected yield on this sort of debt is 12% per annum. Now remember, we're working in six months periods. So the discount, we're going to discount the cash flows of $2 million every six months at 6%. And how many six months periods would there be in five years? There would be 10 periods of five years. And we need to discount each six month period at 6%. So if we look at the actual formula, that two is the $2 million, the, in, the coupon interest payment made every six months. 10 periods are 10 six months periods within the five year life of the bond. And the expected rate of return is 12% per year or 6% every six months, which is what that 0 0.06 is. And so that is the present value of the 10 coupon interest payments made every six months. This is the present value of the $40 million face value of the bond, which will be re repaid in five years time, but we are taking it over 10 periods and each period has an expected rate of return of 6%. So the present value of the coupon interest payments is $2 million times the, the present value factor of the annuity of 7.3601 plus the present value of $40 million in five years time which is 22.336 million, i.e. the market value of debt in this example is 37.1 million. Looking at the limitations of WAC, one key limitation is that a proposed new, investment, a proposed new investment may have a different risk profile to the existing risk that, that an organization faces. So a proposed investment might have a much higher risk profile than what exists at the moment or might have a, a much lower one. A second aspect which needs to be taken into account is when we're looking at the existing weighted average cost of capital and using that to evaluate a proposed new investment is that the investment itself might substantially change the capital structure of the organization which would then change the financial risk. If this happens then the beta of the company should be adjusted to show the new risk profile. A, a large part of the debt might be based on a floating rate interest rate. So the cost of capital will vary as, as the, the market rate varies, and this will continuously change the weighted average cost of capital. Now we look at the application of WAC. As pointed out there, management accountants use it to track performance as well as for specific projects evaluation. We can use VAC, WAC to evaluate projects using NPV and um, internal rate of return, as well as discounted payback. Now a big su assumption, which we've discussed already, is that the, a new project would have a similar risk profile to the organization's existing assets. However, we might need to adjust the cost of capital up or down before using it to evaluate a project, depending on the, how different the project's risk profile is. I'm not going to spend much time looking at learning outcome two. I think most of you are pretty familiar with capital budgeting techniques. Page 11.12 talks about estimating cash flows for capital budgeting. It's important that you remember we are focusing on cash flows and not financial profits. An example of a financial transaction that does not have cash flows 
is is uh, depreciation. So we exclude depreciation from our cash flows, but we do take into account the impact on tax that depreciation might have. And that's covered on page 11.13. I think you're probably well aware of the net present value method. How do you do it? You calculate the NPV and you evaluate the proposal. Do we go ahead or don't we? Is Again, there's a formula for the NPV. I think most of you are more familiar with using an Excel a spreadsheet which we'll look at on page 11.15 and the, the decision really would be if the NPV is positive we accept if the NPV is negative we reject now in, in the real world there are a lot of non-financial aspects which would be taken into account the decision to go ahead or not with the project would not be solely based on whether or not the NPV is positive there's a calculation for NPV effectively the cash flows for each of the years is calculated and then the, the cash flows are discounted to get the, the in present value. The internal rate of return is the discount rate which would result in an NPV of zero for the project and the principle would be we'll accept the project if the IRR exceeds the organization's WAC and reject if it's less than organization's WAC. There's some limitations of, of IRR for you to go through and there are some extra capital budgeting criteria. One common approach is to count how long it will take before the initial investment is recovered. That's the payback period method. One of There's an example of payback. One of the criticisms is that payback ignores the time value of money as well as cash flows that may be received beyond the payback period. So we then have the discounted payback period which overcomes the first limitation and effectively it's, it's similar to the payback um, except that to calculate the payback period uh, cash flows are discounted as per this example over here on page 11.17 and there's also the accounting rate of return where we take the average profit over the period and we divide that by the average investment over the period of the project and the basic principle is that would accept a project if the ARR is greater than WAC and vice versa. There's an example of computing ARR and then we go into sensitivity analysis. And sensitivity analysis effectively looks at how projects behave when the variables that determine their success or failure are altered. And it does give managers a better understanding of the nature and degree of risk that's associated with the project. A key benefit from sensitivity analysis is that it provides answers to a whole lot of what if questions. What, for example, what if inflation is different or sales are different and so on. A limitation of sensitivity analysis is it normally looks at one variable at a time. And in reality, a changing one assumption may have a ripple effect in other areas. So sensitivity analysis is useful in helping managers be more aware of the more sensitive variables. However, it doesn't formally quantify risk or provide a clear-cut rule whether we should accept or reject a project. Learning Outcome 4 looks at behavioral influences as well as other qualitative issues that impact upon investment decision-making. But we need to realize that people are involved and there are non-financial factors which need to be taken into account. Also, we need to be aware that some aspects of discounted cash flow can be objectively calculated, for example, cost of labor, but then other inputs are more subjective. For example, sales forecasts. Pet projects, managers might like a particular project which they're personally involved. Different people have very different views of risk. Some people are very risk averse, whereas others might be very happy to take on risk. Now, qualitative issues vary tremendously from one project to another. There are some examples over here. If you are asked about qualitative and non-financial issues, with regard to an investment project in the exam, don't look to the CSG, for example, don't look to this list of bullet points for your answers. Where you should look at is a specific scenario and you should be able to draw out quantitative issues from the scenario which is presented to you.